Welcome, folks. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I want to thank uh, b &H for putting this event together. It's a terrific event, some really nice things. And I've, I've really been appreciating the sensibility behind bringing things, people like uh, Michael Kenna to talk about the inner spirit of work, and to bring my dad down as well. You know, David was really thrilled. We, we, it took some doing to get my dad to get on a plane. It was the sixth time in 20 years. Um, so for him to share the stage with me tomorrow at 2, that's pretty special, pretty neat. A very different sensibility, and it's really neat to see that uh, the B&H community understands a lot of the history of photography and the other players that are out there. Um, Dad doesn't even know what a social network is. Uh, so it's a different era, and to hear voices from that other era, like Michael only shooting film, it's pretty wonderful. Also want to thank Canon for sponsoring me for so many years, and also x right for those free giveaways. Sandra just gave me those. And I think it's a good uh, opportunity just to note, I'll say it again, uh, might seem a little strange to be giving out things for color management in a black and white session. <laughs> and what I'm hoping today is not to explode your head with a thousand software possibilities, though I will give you resources for lots of follow-up. But I'm hoping to encourage you to see in new ways. That's the real voyage of discovery. That's the real challenge. If we can get away from the tools and the techniques, the traditions, and get into directly seeing, not only seeing our subject, not only seeing light, not only seeing our images, but also seeing what our tools can do. They can do amazing things. And a lot of times, people end up doing things with these tools that wasn't part of the engineer's plan, but they then incorporate it. Believe me, after more than 20 years of consulting with Adobe, I know what that process is like. Same on the printer end. So I'm going to encourage you to think of black and white differently. The reason you need color management more than ever with black and white is black and white, they are colors. In fact, you might even think of them as the colors that all colors share. And they're very critical colors, and they're hard colors to reproduce accurately. Because tiny shifts in brightness or in hue or in saturation will be seen very quickly in near neutral fields. And to achieve absolute neutrality, well, that might be like chasing perfection. And I've seen lots of experts in the community have these long debates about one thing is one point yellow or two points blue, or which settings on certain drivers produce an absolute neutral. But you can only split hairs like that. You can only deal with that kind of subtlety and precision when you've got the color working correctly, or at least consistently, let's put it that way. So let me tell you a little bit more about why I think black and white is color. It is a long-standing debate, and how that's one of the first paradigm shifts we really need to retrain ourselves from. It's, it's, it's a legacy from the 20th century. We're now in the 20th century, and we're using different tools. I want to show you where some of the resources are. I'll point to this throughout the demo, so you don't need to take copious notes. I do recommend you take spare notes, and certainly things which you would want to follow up on, on my website. And the challenge to getting my website is learning how to spell my name. Just grab the B&H literature. They spelled it correctly. Thank you. <laughs> so johnpaulcapanegra.com. Under creativity, you'll see a whole technique section. And this is a whole, well, for each one of these, there's a menu like this. And this is the menu for black and white. There's tons of resources. I'm going to move quickly through a lot of subjects, cutting to the essence of these things and hoping to direct you to the things that will help you see and think a little differently about it. And then when you want to follow up with more technique, you certainly can. Um, you may see in some of these something that says free to members. The members are the ones who sign up for my newsletter. Once a month, I put out a newsletter that tells people about new resources. Some of them are inspiring things like 12 great photographs from Michael Kenna plus 12 great quotes. Others are the next newsletter is going to feature a lot of information about sharpening. So a lot of different kinds of subjects. All you have to do is enter your email. It doesn't get shared. That's where you go for the resources. So uh, to make the best black and white images, we need to A, understand that black and white are colors, the colors that all colors share. Know that black and white needs color management so we can get neutrality, so that we can get, let's turn another technical term out there, gray balance. That is consistent throughout the tonal scale. You don't want your shadows carrying one color and your highlights carrying another. 
you want it to be consistently toned. Even if you're making a platinum print, you want the same brown throughout the whole tonal scale, unless you deliberately want to introduce a color cross, and then you need it even more because you want a precise color cross, not just one that the printer, or God forbid, the monitor gave you. So we start in color. If Ansel were working today, Ansel Adams were working today, he'd be capturing in color. I don't think that means he'd be a color photographer. I do think that he would still continue to be making the types of images he's making, but he would filter after exposure, not before exposure. And there's huge power and creative possibility. Some of you may have seen the change that his classic image, Moonrise over Hernandez, went through each decade. It got darker and more contrasty, more dramatic. After all, he said the negative is the score and the print is the performance. And this is key. Keep your digital negatives, your Photoshop files with all their layers, flexible, layered, don't lock yourself in, so that you can re-perform the image with a minimum amount of effort instead of having to build it from the ground up. We want to optimize color before conversion. And we actually want to optimize it in a very specific way. At the risk of repeating myself, I'm going to say it now and again later. You actually want to clear out any kinds of color casting. You want to boost saturation as high as possible without introducing any clipping into the highlights, shadows, or posterization, i.e., ideal color. 5,000K, strip out a color cast, boosted really high in saturation, but not to the point of crazy posterization, is going to start to give you the best black and white conversion. So you actually have to know how to color adjust your file to get the best black and white conversions. There are many ways of converting to black and white. In my DVD, I list 13 or 14 of them. I think my friend Vinny Versace has identified a 15th or a 16th. I haven't had a bottle of wine with him recently. He may have found a 17th or an 18th. <laughs> but you don't need 18 different ways to make color conversions. And I'm going to show you the two go-to ways that are going to satisfy more than 80% of the cases that you'll need. And I'm going to show you what to look for in terms of why you would choose one over another. Sometimes it depends on the image. Afterwards, we'd like to optimize the global contrast before the local contrast. A lot of people try and build in the contrast during the conversion. Instead, lay in a good tonal foundation. And I'll give you visual examples of that. Optionally, at the end of it, you may want to add color back in. So if you want to make a cyanotype, you're going to need a little bit of cyan and a little bit of blue. If you want to make a platinum print, or the digital equivalent of a platinum print, you're going to need a little bit of yellow and a little bit of red. You see where I'm going. Not all black and white prints are black and white. Platinum prints are brown and white. Cyanotypes are blue and white. Oh, and by the way, there's some blacks and whites in there, too. <laughs> blue blacks and blue whites. You see where I'm going. Interestingly, you can make prints on any medium. You can go back out to another piece of analog film if you use an LVT film recorder. A laser exposes a sheet of film, and you go back into the traditional darkroom. You use silver gelatin paper or whatever else you'd like. There's been a huge resurgence in alternative processes because of digital contact negatives. Using inkjet printers on transparent substrates that can now be made very large scale. And interestingly, you start making test negatives rather than test prints to get the final one. Luckily, they print very consistently if you keep your chemistry stable. There's some great resources on there out there. Just want to highlight that contrary to a lot of the fears 10, 15, 20 years ago, oh my god. Digital is killing analog. It's all going to go away. In fact, it's created a resurgence in alternative processes. It's a really fascinating time to be around. We're faced with extraordinary choices. And that's one of the big issues that we have to deal with when we're making our black and white conversions. Before we go there, I'd love to celebrate what's unique about black and white, or just some of the things that are unique about black and white. Black and white is, to my mind, a color palette that has some very specific characteristics. And it does specific things to our nervous system. We think about it in specific ways. We have specific emotions. Now, when I say specific, I mean there are some shared qualities that many people also share with us. It doesn't mean that there is only one way of thinking about it. If people have a lot of feelings about black and white, some of them, the past, historic. Remember, there used to be a day where televisions were black and white, and newspapers didn't have color. And so they were more truthful because they were black and white. And that's being shifted. Those are cultural norms that have been changed by technology. But it's quite interesting that it still holds to some degree. Most would consider it the past because it's part of our history. 
other question, neutral, quiet, restful. There's this kind of a, a settling down. If you look at each of the elements of color, luminosity, which is what we're talking about, black and white, hue, the Roy G. Biv or the rainbow, and saturation, how intense is that color? Is it near neutral or is it very intense and saturated? Each one of those is a quality of energy. Add more of each, you get more and more energy, sometimes too much energy. So by directing all of the energy into one component of color, we create a different sensation. Other times, people will use things like abstract or essential, even ethereal. We don't see the world in black and white. It's a huge transformation. They say some animals see it in black and white. I don't know. They say we only see in black and white at night. Nah, I see color. But the less light, the less color. Okay, there's a lot of interesting dialogue about it, and sometimes you just have to go for the ride because it's not always clear, but there's a long history of this debate, and it even goes into the world of painting, and being informed about it really helps. But I think it's important to celebrate that we really are creating a dramatic transformation in our images. Jerry Ilsman works in black and white, and it makes his surreal composites even more dreamlike. It's a different kind of thing when you get into color. Believe me, I know. My floating rocks have a different quality because they're in color, sometimes near neutral. It certainly is more interpreted. So when we create this dramatic transformation, we are exerting some control. Ansel might be using a red filter. We might be filtering our digital files. But the choice to make a very dramatic, dark, contrasty sky is an interpretation. And then the negative is the score. The print is the performance. The photographer is the director or the conductor. So thinking a little bit more about those qualitative aspects are important. Let me highlight one other thing. Our eyes actually use this light and dark to find contours and positions in space. Interesting that the objectness of our perception is often heavily laid by this light and dark foundation. It's also the least relative component of color. In other words, it's harder to get it to shift in context with other colors and in different lighting situations like night. If we turn the lights down even further than they are now, your eyes will do up pretty quickly, more quickly to the light and dark than it will to the color. And of course, your eyes white balance. We don't have the same kind of equivalent of white balance for, for our eyes. So what I'm really trying to celebrate is what happens when we go from something like this on the left to that on the right. And there's so many ways to do it, obviously. There's a lot of possibility, even within a simple image that is predominantly blue and white. Same file, just filtered differently. There's more on that on my website if you want to talk about what's unique about black and white and even some in my color psychology resources about the colors, black, gray, and white. They all, by color psychologists, are studied and they have some interesting shared qualities. So to further that, if black and white is color, this is my phrase. I don't know if Jeff Shiwi loves to tease me when I say, look, if you can see it, it's color. Color is our visual response, and it's important to understand that we're deeply involved in that visual response. There's the light, the object that's being the light is being reflected from, and there's the observer. So in that sense, color is an event, because color is what happens up here. We have this tiny little slice in the electromagnetic spectrum called visible light. There is more out there, so they tell me. <laughs> if we broke all this color, our visual response, what's going on in our eye and in our brain, a lot of the color interpretation happens by interpreting the data our eyes deliver to our brain. At I think it's over a billion impressions per second, but at the risk of understating it, hundreds of millions of impressions per second, we filter a lot of data out and we interpret it. We grab onto the stuff we think is significant, we dump the stuff that we don't think is as significant. So we look at color. It's useful to break it down into three different elements. Color luckily only has three elements. Hue, the one what you usually think about, oh, that's color. The Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet. That's often plotted as a circle. Saturation, how intense is the color? As you get further out, you get towards, I'm plotting the chromaticity diagrams of a given device, like a monitor or a printer, or even the human eye. This one happens to be the, the, happens to be lab, what the human eye can see. As we get further away from neutral, right in the center, we get more and more saturated. 
So that means this neutral spine, we can really only see in three dimensions here from white, our ISO brightness, through down to black, our DMAX, or our blackest black, which any color space, whether it's our eyes, a monitor, or a printer has, we're really talking about operating very close to or right on this spine that unites all of these other colors, that joins the complementary colors of cyan and red, or yellow and blue. It's this intermediary meeting place. Interestingly, we can see color casts in there. You might even see it on this screen right now. The blacks are being rendered a little bit warm, a little bit red down there. That's really just a color management issue between this computer and that projector. We need a better profile. Spend a little time, we can get a profile to make sure that renders absolutely neutrally. Same kind of thing that you're dealing with when you're trying to make a print or when you're viewing this on the monitor. Luckily, my monitor looks neutral. Start there. That's what you need that I want to display too for. If you don't have a colorimeter, please calibrate your monitor. One of the most important things is setting the brightness of your monitors appropriately. For accurate prediction to print, set it to 100 or even 90. The default is usually 120 too bright. When people are saying my prints are coming out too dark, that's one of the reasons why. All right. So all hues share this, and there are many types of black and white from neutral, which might be close to silver gelatin, to a warm tone, which could be a warm toner with silver gelatin, or it could be platinum, to cyanotype, or even cross-toned, let's say chlorobromide papers. A lot of my thinking got developed by being in the darkroom with my father, and I remember one day when he was showing me these different papers and chemistry that he was using. I said, Dad, why are you printing the same image on all of these different papers with these different chemistries? I mean, it's black and white. No, 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 no. There's a lot of color in black and white. Look at this one. Can you see the trace amount of warmth in the shadows here? And can you see how this one over here has a cooler rendition? And you see how it's changing the spatial relationships within the image? Suddenly my eyes were open. I no longer looked at black and white as uh, just black and white. But there was this rich world of semi-neutrals. And I saw that it did things to my image uh, all images uh, were quite unique and quite interesting. Interestingly, the ability to reproduce these accurately is extremely important. Uh, if you have a color cast and you see it in these grayscale ramps that you'll often see, they're really good for testing. Very often that will also be present in the color field, but you won't see it because all of that other saturated color is overwhelming it. But when you clear out that color cast and get down to that neutral quality, you're going to see all the other colors more clearly. And of course, it's really important that you not introduce color casts like this unless you meant to do that, to quote Pee Wee Herman. Uh, because if the printer gives you this when you were expecting this, <laughs> or you see this on your monitor when you're trying to print this, <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> b &H, we have a solution. x right. Okay. So interesting question. What's neutral? I think most of us would agree we're somewhere in between here, and I've deliberately put it too cool on the left and too warm on the right. But exactly where we would land, that would be an individual difference. Our eyes actually change over time, and our eyes adapt. We would have a different answer if we were tired, if we drank a lot of caffeine, if we ate a lot of sugar, or if somebody had really upset us. We literally do see red. <laughs> You need to be very careful, and part of that is the viewing light that you're evaluating prints under, as well as the monitor that you're looking at it. So it's really important to have a high quality display, well calibrated. It's really important to have a high quality light source when evaluating proofs, never more so than when you're looking at a black and white image. And it's important to think about what light your prints will be exhibited under. If you make prints under a really good high quality light source, but then you put it under something that's quite different, like the light that my hands are in right now is quite warm, quite yellow, your entire black and white image is going to get a lot warmer. So the light that you display it under is important. In context, most of these look fairly neutral. Take that context out and suddenly you start to see all of these rich colors and that none of them are actually neutral. Some are a little more neutral than others. There's a lot of possibilities. In addition, if you surround neutral colors with saturated colors, i.e. you hang your black and white prints on a red wall, 
you can anticipate your prints looking cyan. It's the complement of red. You can see that this blue surround makes this look yellower, and this yellow surround looks bluer. They don't look the same, but if we took that around, out, does anybody doubt that these are the same colors? If we took that out, you'd see that those are exactly the same color. So color is contextual. And that's important in the tonal scale as well. I couldn't believe it when Dad was showing me uh, Albers studies. His students, he would do these Albers studies with neutral colored pieces of paper and show how tones would shift in relationship to other tones. It's quite interesting. So let's talk about preparing for conversion. As I said, you want to set your white point and black point. The overall brightness, the most important, clear those color casts and set saturation high. Why? There's not a lot of tonal variety in this where the white balance is set for the sky. Here the white balance was set for the foreground. In general, both of those are a little more saturated. The blues are coming up today. If you white balance it for both and boosted it high, and this is right on the edge of where I'd look out, I'd be zooming into areas like this and making sure I wasn't introducing posterization or reducing separation actually having more like that would allow me to get a greater contrast between the yellow and the blue. That yellow or blue you'll see very quickly could be either light or dark. It's up to me. It's up to you, depending on how you choose to convert it. This has some implications for how you'll prep your file. If I just set my black point and white point, I'll get a better dynamic range. I'll have close to white and close to black. That's certainly a good starting point. If I use the eyedropper, say in levels or curves, this gray point dropper, to wipe out that yellow cast, I'll start to see greater separation between the yellow, the blue, and the red. There's even an old school trick in Photoshop where you do that for all three channels. I'm here in levels, going down to red, and moving my white point to the part where the main mass of the histogram starts. This image has some clipped shadows. I'd be doing the same thing on the left side if those shadows weren't clipped. Then moving it to a different point with the green and a still different point with the blue. And you can see how the color rendition of this is quite a bit different than that. And this is actually not accurate to the scene as it was shot. This is much more accurate. It was late in the day in Ravenna in November. But this, clearing out the color cast, is going to allow me to make more of the saturated blues, yellows, and reds, and allow me to make those lighter or darker much more easily. This is going way beyond dodging and burning. This is laying in a tonal foundation, the tonal structure. And that's where those black and white conversions come in so heavily. But you can see it helps to process the file to prepare it for that conversion. There are many ways. Here are 13. Please do not memorize this. <laughs> Instead, let's use Occam's razor or the KISS principle. Keep it as simple as possible. We'll, we'll listen to Einstein make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. And we'll talk about two or three go-to ways. When they're at the, in the interest of keeping it um, brisk today, um, I won't show you the raw conversion. I do want to show you this dual adjustment layer and the localized adjustment. I think most of you are familiar with it. Maybe, maybe we'll be able to touch on it pretty quickly. Think of these as progressively more complex solutions that not all images need. If I shot uh, a foggy seascape and it was predominantly blue or mostly one color, this could be a Navajo sandstone landscape. <coughs> If we had mostly one color or it was already pretty close to neutral, like much of the ice that I shoot in Antarctica, we don't need one of these more complex solutions and would be absolutely fine handling that conversion during raw processing. On the other hand, if you start to have a more complex image like this, the tonal structure of this image is completely up for grabs, more up for grabs than you would think, and this is what makes this notion of pre-visualization or seeing the possibilities, not knowing exactly what you're going to get, but seeing the possibilities so you can explore them and end up on a solution that you own at the end of the day. That's really what pre-visualization is about. 
Now we need to start thinking about more complex solutions like dual adjustment layers and even adding in selections into this mix. Let me show you. Let's just jump in and do that really quickly. I'm doing this, I'm in Photoshop, if I were in Lightroom, or opening up the image through Bridge when I got into Camera Raw, um, I wouldn't be in Photoshop, I'd be coming out of Bridge. Under our HSL sliders, you have this Convert to Grayscale, and it'll come in with this default set of percentages, which will allow you to change certain colors, and you can even come in and scrub on some of those colors as well. So all of my reds move, all of my oranges move. One of the useful things about this is if you were to do this with a dual adjustment layer that I'm going to show you, notice in, in the next set that I'm going to show you, you won't have an orange and an aqua. Those extra two sliders allow you to split the difference between closely matched colors, which can often be very important. And you see what's going on in the test strip to the right with all of those colors. You can see how with the aquas I'm able to move certain colors and the greens I move other colors. And that's going to allow me to get contrast to assign a brightness value to those specific colors uh, with more precision and I can get more separation between closely matched colors. That's where you need the more advanced techniques. What I can't do with this is I can't make a selection to just adjust this piece of paper. I'd have to do that in Photoshop. If I think about making a black and white conversion to one small area of an image, I'm instantly thinking I'm going to be doing that in Photoshop because Lightroom has limited masking, doesn't have the ability to make this kind of mask, same with Camera Raw, and I can do that brilliantly in Photoshop. You'll also notice that while I can explore my options by make, moving these sliders, I very often lost what I originally saw in the color image, and I recommend having a color version of the image in your field of vision while you're making the conversion so that you can see what the possibilities are. Like, I'm going to duplicate this file. Several methods of dual adjustment layers. The one that I prefer the most is using the channel mixer, which basically will mix all of the channels to be the same when you check monochrome. And it comes up with the default conversion, which you would get if you made a grayscale conversion. Please don't do that. You'll eliminate your future flexibility. You'd only want to do that when you're sending a derivative file out to a specific device like an offset press, or we're making a negative on a particular kind of device. Otherwise, you always want to preserve your color. You don't want to convert to grayscale. And that's true when you print it as well. You want to print your RGB layered file directly to the printer. In this case, what I want is an extreme conversion. I want to go for broke. At, honestly, it actually doesn't matter, in most cases, which one you choose. So I'm just going to come in here and make sure that these guys add up to about 100%. If you do a lot more than 100%, you're going to clip your highlights. They'll blow out. If you do much more than that, you'll clip your shadows. And you'll also gray down your highlights. Generally, you want some combination that adds up to 100%. Here, I'm just choosing one channel because I know I'm getting an extreme adjustment. But I don't plan on sticking with that adjustment. I call this, we're calling this dual adjustment layers because we're going to use another adjustment layer on top of this. We're going to break the norm of our workflow and we're going to come back and make this adjustment layer below. So I'm coming back to my layer here and I make a second adjustment layer. Yes, this technique is only two adjustment layers. And I'll repeat that in just a second. But first, I'm going to get hue saturation. So why would I get hue saturation? Well, so I can do this. And now can you see how I can visually explore hundreds of possibilities very quickly? And I can see that with this image, I could choose either a dark ground or a light ground, dark pieces of paper or light pieces of paper. And in fact, the light pieces of paper are light at different settings. Different pieces of paper are light at different settings, which would indicate to me that if I wanted them all light on dark, I could get there. Let me show you. It's amazing that you can get there from here. If you wanted dark on light, you can also get there from here. <laughs> Having been taught the traditional way to visualize stripping out color and just looking at the way that light rests and falls, casts shadows, highlights, renders form, 
to now have to filter in every field of color. When I put on this black and white conversion filter and I look at this room, I instantly identify the saturated shirts. All you guys and girls with red shirts can now either be light or dark. There's a couple of spots of blue in the, in the field and a couple of yellows that could go light or dark. See, the whole structure is so variable that when you look at an image like this, you really have to say, look, there's hue, there's a fair amount of saturation. That area can be either light or dark, nearly white or nearly black, or anything in between. <laughs> this is a real mind shift. If the whole thing were mostly gray, we wouldn't have that possibility. We wouldn't need these dual adjustment layers or selections. But when you have this kind of control, it really pays to explore your options. One of the things I'd like to emphasize here is using Photoshop as a tool for exploration. So if we've come in with our channel mixer here and we start swinging these sliders, like the hue saturation slider, come on, it exists, there you go. Wildly, it's not indecision, it's research. It's finding out what's possible. And I strongly encourage you to inform yourself, to educate yourself, to find out what's possible before you commit to a final solution. There is no one right solution. Remember, we don't see in black and white. Very few things in the world are truly black and white. There are a few, but we see in color. So why not decide to change one piece of paper and make it lighter than the others? How would I do that? Masks. Okay, so I'm gonna have to take a little bit of time. I've already made these masks ahead of time. This would take a few minutes, maybe half an hour, to get it done just right. I encourage you guys, if you're not sure that this image is gonna work or this solution is gonna work, just make a rough selection. Don't spend a lot of time making the perfect selection. Find out what's possible. Then once you know you've got a solution that you like, spend the time refining those masks. Again, do the research first find the optimal solution, and then start noodling the details. Work much more broadly. So you can see here I'm taking a couple of pieces of paper there. The original conversion with the black background. Add in a few accents there. It's all up for grabs. It's really just a matter of making these selections with a different hue saturation adjustment layer to what have we been doing the whole time? Changing the color. The reason that this changes the color changes the black and white, is because under this, we've changed the hue. Now, I never in my wildest dreams would have changed it to this Pepto-Bismol pink. <laughs> Not in my wildest dreams. But that may well be the set of color relationships we need to generate the final black and white conversion, the tonal foundation that we're looking for so much. And again, all you have to do is move the slider and more importantly, feel these tones, respond to it, see what's, what the image has to tell you. Moving quickly. After you do the black and white conversion, it's so important to fine tune the contrast. If any of you are suffering from curves, and I know many of the folks that come into my workshops, either for printing or even in the field, do suffer fear of curves. <laughs> Remember, it's what the traditional darkroom was all about. It's actually like the go-to tool. After the black and white conversion, you need to master this tool. There is no more precise tool for being able to come in and grab the highlights, move them up or down. I'm just using that scrubby tool right there. Grab certain shadows or midtones and move them down come back in and reshape a curve, not based on chemistry and paper and how long that chemistry lasts or how hot or cold that chemistry gets, but based on reshaping the curve to create a certain set of tonal relationships for a particular image, giving you a desired result. Very often, all you need is three points to shape the right kind of contrast. Typically, it's a matter of adding contrast when you take the saturation and the hue out of an image, it loses some of that energy. Generally, your black and white conversion is a little flatter, and you need to boost the contrast, but often in very specific ways. Sometimes you'll want to pull out very fine separation in the highlights. 
Other times you'll want to steepen the curve in the shadows and get more separation, particularly when you go to print those shadows. Most printers end up dumping some of the shadows, over inking it, and very often steepening the curve in those areas will bring to life some of the shadow detail as well. This is your go-to tool. Spend half an hour with it, and you'll spend a lifetime with it. Right? Don't suffer fear of curves. <laughs> but do practice in any order curves. Keep it simple. Again, as few points as possible. Keep them smooth. Be careful about um, posterization. How do we add color? How do we go from here to here or here? Well, actually, in one of several ways, you could use any color adjustment tool. I actually prefer curves, believe it or not. Because you can come into a single channel, and now let's say we can add a little bit of red to my highlights and a little bit of cyan to my shadows and come up with a very specific cross tone. Not one that the chlorobromide paper and a specific developer got, but the, Im the colors that I chose for this image based on what I wanted to do with it. You can also do very uniform changes if you want to add a kind of a platinum effect. Just one point in the middle, add some red, come down to the blue, take a little blue out, or another way of saying that is adding yellow, so you still need a little color theory, to come up with whatever warm tone solution you like. There's another way. <coughs> if you're going for these monochromatic solutions, and I'm going to wrap in three minutes, <laughs> you want to think about using the printer manufacturer's black and white solutions. The printer software, whether it's Epson or Canon, this is the Epson driver, this is the Canon driver, all have these non-ICC compliant solutions, thank goodness, to reseparate the file. The key is that when you send it from Lightroom or Photoshop, you're letting the printer manage the color should be a clue for us as well that this is going to make printing on third-party substrates a little more challenging, but the lookup tables work quite well. You're probably going to have to come in and use some of the color toning options that allow you to shift the tone. Image Print does an interesting version where it can cross-tone the highlights and the shadows in case you come up with, with that. What are the advantages of printing with these black and white solutions? It separates the file differently and uses less of the saturated ink. Therefore, it's less susceptible to color shifts. It uses more black ink. The blacks are blacker. You're taking it from, a, say, a 235 DMAX up to a 265. Did I just say that an inkjet print can be blacker than a silver gelatin print? Yes, I did. Ansel Adams, Selenium Tone, Silver Tone, Gelatin, 2.35. Inkjet print on a glossy surface, printed through the advanced black and white solution, whichever driver it is, 2.65. It's going up as ink sets improve. We're getting blacker blacks. That does not mean that a inkjet print looks the same as a silver gelatin. Silver gelatin has a particular quality. This silver suspended in gelatin reflecting light in a particular way. Ink on paper has another quality, also very beautiful but different. And now we're starting to see the contrast ratio of our prints go higher than we've ever seen before. We're able to get a little more snap out of them blacker blacks, whiter whites than ever before. This is your solution for getting the blackest blacks, but most of these solutions have monochromatic or uniform toning. That is, you could make a, uh, a platinum or cyanotype, but it would be hard to do something that was as complex as this, where it might be locally toned or cross-toned or trace amounts of the original color are there. If this is the look that you want, you end up printing this file as a color file through Photoshop or Lightroom. There you would let Photoshop or Lightroom manage the color. Daily, you use your custom profile, which again, if you're using third-party substrates, will be for that substrate, not the defaults that the manufacturers supply. So you've got a lot of options. The other option is to go work with a service bureau who has a laser that can expose film and make a whole new piece of silver gelatin egg. I've had to retouch eggs for Arnold Newman, for my dad, for a number of people to get them new masters that are every bit as good as the original but they may have been a little bit retouched, or somebody scratched it, or they wanted to sharpen it a little bit. They actually can be better than the originals. <laughs> what would be even better is if those people started with color, we could completely change the conversion to what they wanted, and then you optimize that silver gelatin piece. 
Chip Ferrelli does this quite a lot. I'm not sure if you know him as a photographer. All right. Um, there is a lot more to say, but I've said a ton on my website. And I'll direct you to those resources. And also, if you're interested in the printing aspect of it, this is a new ebook that I just released recently that's free up on my website. Just go to my blog. You can download it pretty quickly. I think I covered the basics there. Find out what these new tools in the 21st century can do for you. Figure out what you would like to do and then use them to get where you want to go. We've never had this kind of control ever in the history of photography, and it just keeps getting better. All we have to do is figure out where we want to go. No small task, but it's the real task. And be more sensitive to light, to photography itself. That's what will make your black and white images really sing, you. So thank you, guys. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.